Hi, my name is John Jenkins. I'm a resident of Babinette, Alabama, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning or this evening, as the case may be. I want you to know that I've been interviewed, being interviewed, and perhaps the greatest uh, the thing about all of this is that I'm being interviewed by my favorite wonderful, wonderful grandchild, <laughs> Jamie Jernigan. So give her a big hand. Uh, my father was named Edward Jenkins, my mother Lucille Jenkins. Uh, she was a lifelong housewife and daddy was a teacher at Louisiana Tech, chemistry teacher. Life growing up, of course this, this is a good history lesson because when I was a very small boy it was the famous depression and life then was very unlike it has been in so many other times in our history and it is now because uh, but what we consider normal now was abnormal then. Uh, there was not a great deal of investment in the country, therefore there was not nearly as much manufacturer, manufacturing, or therefore not nearly as many jobs. And so, so many people were out of work, people who were intelligent and capable, but they could not find work. And if you can't find work, you have trouble eating and sleeping and living. And that was, that was the situation. So growing up, what I considered normal or would certainly not be normal today. But then as I was older, the great change was gradually taking place. But what brought us out of the depression and what changed everyone's life was World War II. And there again, you have to know some history of we, we're just, what, uh, 25 years from what was called the Great War, World War I. And so many people were killed and actually maimed and deformed because of the type of warfare it was, or because they were in, often in trenches being shelled and shot at for days on end without ceasing. It affected their minds as well as their bodies, their physique. And so um, most people did not want any part of war. And our country was not well prepared for war. And if we had, uh, if our government had declared war on another country at that time, a whole lot of people would not have fought. They would not have taken part And our Congress probably would have impeached the president and done away with the military. But the situation was different. Our country was attacked and very much um, a military and life immediately was affected. And that um, we were very much afraid that our country was about to be invaded on the west coast and we couldn't stop it. And so um, what made life so different was the fact that the country came together as a whole. Mm -hmm. There were not people arguing over their status in life, the politics of the country or the state or whatnot, or of anything other than joining together and helping each other and getting this country out of the war and being able to continue the life that we have because of our constitution and our background. And so the later part of my childhood, uh, growing up beyond childhood, there was at the beginning of the war when the country came together so well. And this sounds like a terrible thing to say, but as far as living life in the United States, 
in a way it's never been better because people weren't nagging at each other over petty things or even over big things. People were together. People were united in a common cause. They supported each other. They got along and helped each other in this common cause. And it made life great, although there's certainly not anything great about going to a war and fighting and killing people and getting killed or injured. But that part made life good, very good, in that um, it's a trite thing to say, but everybody was your friend. Everybody got along and everybody was working for a common purpose. And of course that work, to use that word, uh, got us out of the depression because suddenly there were more jobs than could be filled. And people that didn't have a job and weren't able to know where the next meal was coming from, suddenly they were able to get a job in the shipyards, in munitions manufacture, or in armament, or in making clothing for the armed forces, or in farming, raising uh, food for the armed forces, and so forth and so on. And there was no problem getting a job. The standard of living went up tremendously. And perhaps the, the greatest problem was finding a place to live. Because here in this section, in Mobile, uh, suddenly Mobile was flooded with people working in the shipyards and shipbuilding and ship repairing and transporting goods in and out of the port and there was not nearly enough housing for them. And so perhaps the most critical thing faced here and in so many other places during the war was a place to stay. And in my personal childhood, I didn't face that. And we didn't have any heavy industry in Ruston, so I was aware of that, but I didn't face it. And so my growing up, um, becoming of age during the war, was uh, oh, one of the big things about the war. I went to a brand new high school and it was high tech, wonder of wonders. We had a speaker in every room and you could talk from the office to the classroom. They could play the radio from the office to the classroom or play a record from there so that daily we had news reports on the war. And I had several classes where uh, they had a large map on the wall of the world and put pens in the map daily where our troops were, where the battles were, or where something was going on in the war. And so besides keeping up with the news, we learned a great deal of geography and uh, about people around the world places that we had never heard of became important everyday words. And so that was that was a good part of education during the war. And uh, of course, uh, there were a lot of other things that uh, affected schools and growing up, they, there was almost a constant drive for something to buy war bonds, war stamps, to collect aluminum or other metals, newspaper, rags, all sorts of things. Um, as a Boy Scout, we went door to door and knock on the door, you know, you have any old newspapers to contribute to the old paper drive or aluminum pots and bands to give to the aluminum drive. And uh, that was the chief way we were affected by the war, of course, what we did, we had blackouts, but of course there was not a enemy plane that came within 3,000 miles of us, but still we played war on the home front. And, and what, we also went to classes to, in school, I shouldn't leave that part out, but actually so much of the war like that was great fun for us. We thought we were doing something big and it was a big contribution actually. Doing without sugar was fun because it was 
for the war effort. And I, we could hardly buy cigarettes <laughs> as kids because they all went to war. And that was, that was my, my childhood and the beginning of growing up. I lived in Ruston until I joined the Navy, and then of course I lived in various things, the Navy, and after that I went to school at Louisiana Tech, my hometown, also some other places, uh, but my residence when I actually moved somewhere was Natchez, Mississippi, and New Orleans, and Wiggins, Mississippi, and now the eastern shore of Baldwin County. I graduated in 1945. I got a bachelor's in 1951, and a uh, the certificate of guidance and counseling in 60 four and a um, master's in 75 and a doctorate in 78. Probably uh, the single greatest thing was the fact that it was early in high school that I discovered that about half of the school population was not an annoyance to be avoided, to keep away from, but they were very pleasant to be around. And it's one of the great revelations of my life. And I didn't learn it in the classroom necessarily, but I just picked it up. And it, it's been just one of the great pleasures of life since then. Okay. That was, that was the opposite gender. <laughs> All right, my first children were twins and boys, and one of the boys died the second day, uh, but I have five that lived, and the twin actually died about 35 miles from here. He was a Navy pilot, and he was in a crash uh, down near the Pedido River in 1979, and that I have four living children, David, Edwin, Eva, and Leonard, of those four. Okay. I was, I was 17 and one day. July 3rd. I joined the Navy the day after my birthday, and why, um, they're going back to the war probably as early as the junior year long in there. I guess every boy in high school tried to join up. And it was a, pretty much a regular affair that we'd go to some recruiting office and try to sign up, so forth. And um, the reason I chose the Navy was at the time, um, my ambition was to fly an aeroplane. I was big on aeroplanes, and uh, the Navy gave me much greater encouragement about getting into a flight school than uh, the Air Force, which was called the Army Air Force at that time, or the Marines, which is part of the Navy, of course. Okay. And so, Went to the Navy. Okay. It can best be described, I think, as the first school I went to. <laughs> and the school was called Aviation Fundamentals, which was abbreviated AVFUN. Have fun. <laughs> and which easily translates into have fun. And so that's certainly what I tried to do. 
And, but my job specifically, or, although I seldom actually did what I was trained to do, was to repair and maintain uh, all, actually all parts of an aircraft behind the firewall. The firewall separates the engine from the rest. And I was not an engine repair man, but I repaired the frame or the outer covering, the skin, it's called fabric or metal, the hydraulic system, electric system, and the armament systems, so forth. Like I say, in theory, that was my job. Okay. Everything behind the firewall. I was stationed in South Louisiana and I had been somewhere, I think, home in Ruston on a leave or weekend pass, something like that. And I was traveling from New Orleans to Homa, where the air station was, and by bus, the Greyhound bus. And I was uh, waiting for the bus and I was reading and a, a pair of shoes went by and I noticed the shoes and the legs. Um, and then uh, when I started to board the bus, uh, the same shoes and legs got on the bus. And uh, so she tells the story. There were three other people on the bus uh, when I got on. And I went up and said, is this seat taken next to her? And sure enough, it wasn't. And so I taught Natchez High School and West Jefferson High School and um, Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. And that's all. And there were different kinds of um, like that, the most fearful experience, because I can remember that one very well. Um, the um, at Homa, the place I mentioned earlier. Um, at that time, when the war was shutting down, you know, and, and we had planes that were uh, being stored there. Um, well, long story. It had been. It was a blimp base. And the blimp hangar was a huge, huge thing. They could hold literally hundreds of airplanes with their wings folded, the wings off. Literally hundreds because it was designed to hold six blimps or four of the larger blimps. But um, when those planes were brought in, and some of them came from this area, from uh, uh, Barron Field in on um, Foley, for instance. We had a bunch of planes that came in to Homa. But at any rate, those planes were uh, brought in there and uh, to be stored, what called preserved, put a lot of grease on moving parts and took all the spark plugs out of the engines and put a silica gel, you know, silicone absorbs moisture, put a silica gel plug in place of that in the engines to absorb the moisture, and then left them there in the hangar. But every, as I remember, 10th plane was um, restored to flying condition and depreserved, we called it. And then it was test flown, and then they preserve it, put it back in there. And on the test flights, um, they enlisted men like me who were working on the hangar line, went up with the pilot, and we made uh, notes so he wouldn't have to do any writing, so he wouldn't have to do any work except fly the plane. <laughs> he didn't do anything, as a matter of fact, except fly the plane. And one time, I was in a plane uh, called an SB2C, a Curtis-made plane, called a Hell Diver. It was a late model dive bomber the Navy, and uh, as we check in the various systems, um, you know, the landing gears go up and down and the flaps go up and down uh, through a hydraulic system, 
which could also be operated electrically, and um, and another way. And in the course of testing, uh, he said, and I can't get the wheels down, you know, which is an unpleasant sort of feeling. <laughs> and then he said, I can't get the flaps down. Now that's with the hydraulic system. So I tried the electric operating uh, pumps. They didn't work either. And so he said, Jenkins, it looks like we're gonna have to jump out of this thing. <laughs> and and uh, that was certainly the most memorable and unpleasant thing. And actually, he was kidding me because they, there's a third system, which I forgot, it's a hand pump that you can operate it. And there was just enough hand pump pressure to get the wheels down. Now the flaps never came down, but uh, he did the pumping. He neglected to mention that. And we came in extremely fast, but without any incident, you know, it just perfectly normal other than fast. But they said that I was a bad shade of green when I got <laughs> out of that plane. And that that certainly is a most memorable I like more. Oh, I like conducting I, I must say. I must say that but don't get me wrong, that oh, it's not the idea so many people have that oh, that when you're conducting, you're, you're playing the whole band, you're playing a, a mass instrument. It's not, you're playing another one. And so often that's something that, uh, or something you teach practice teachers when you have them. I've had practice teachers under me and one of the things that say that, um, that you're not doing anything any more important than the third clarinet. What you're doing is important, but what the third clarinet's doing is just as important as you are, and don't ever forget it. But there is a great deal of satisfaction in that you, you can shape the music, so forth, the way you can, and when you're playing the third clarinet, you're more shaping it the way the conductor wants or thinks it should be. The first thing that comes to my mind, or and probably would stay there a long time, would be uh, the first time I ever picked up a cigarette. <laughs> if I'd said, you lie. And it, it sounds amusing, but that's had the, perhaps the worst effect on my life as anything else. And I'm oh, very serious in that, very serious that I would certainly change that.